This is a very special series of, of lessons that we're bringing to you. Uh, they are all done in the Holy Land itself. At this moment, I am standing uh, in an area that David developed. This is called David's City. It is just outside the giant walls we have over here behind us uh, that are today's walls around the city. And uh, David built this area <laughs> 3,000 years ago, of course. And uh, we wish to study about this. How do you get to be a king? And how do you get to be such a fantastic king? that even 3,000 years later, we name our children David after this person that lived 3,000 years ago. Now, David was the second king of Israel. Saul was the first king of Israel. And physically, he was great. But morally on the inside, he was carried away with pomp and power. And that's the name of the series of talks here. It is so easy for you and me or any of us to get carried away with the fashions of this world and with the power that comes along with riches. We're going to study about David, this historic figure from the land of Israel, and we're standing right now where David walked, right below me are rooms that he had in his palace. This is where he built uh, his palace. You say, how did he become a king? It has to be a miracle because he was a shepherd boy. And he's remembered in history as a giant killer. Because between him and his mighty men, they destroyed about five are these enormous creatures called giants. They were not afraid of them. David was the one that killed the first one. His mighty men succeeded him, killing off the rest of the family of the giants of Gath. This David, the son of Jesse, uh, the Word of God speaks of him as, as the son of Abraham bring him in direct lineage of the Messiah that was to come and redeem the total of mankind. He had a very strange beginning. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 11, it says, Samuel said to Jesse, God told me that there was a king in this household. Uh, we've had these six men come before me, Jesse's sons, and the spirit said, no, surely you've got another boy somewhere. Are there other children? He said, well, there remaineth yet the youngest, a middle teenager possibly. He keeps the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, go and get him. I will not sit down until he's here. That was determination. He didn't mean play around about it. He meant bring him in. The next verse, which is verse 12, says that they sent and brought in David. He was ruddy. His cheeks were red and bright. He was of a beautiful countenance. Had a smile for everybody. Had a positive outlook upon life. He was a winner in everything he tried to do. It says he was good to look at. He was a handsome young man. And Jehovah said to the prophet, Arise, anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel said, It's time to do the anointing. The next verse says that Samuel took the horn of oil and that he anointed David in the midst of all the brethren and the rest of the family, possibly their neighbors, and it says, the Spirit of Jehovah, now this is verse 13, the Spirit of Jehovah came upon David from that day. That's something. He got an anointing from that anointing oil. 
that didn't, didn't last just for one day. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. He just left the family after he had anointed this young man to be the king. How beautiful it was. From a shepherd boy, he was anointed a king. He had a further story than that. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the next chapter. And in verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of this giant. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine personally, himself. 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're but a child. You're just a youth. He is a man of war from his youth. The next verse is verse 34. David said unto Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion. Then they later came a bear to take a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him. I smote him. I delivered it out of his mouth. And when the lion and the bear arose against me for taking one of my lambs, I caught him by the beard, and I smote him, and I slew him. <laughs> by this time, King Saul was shaking and trembling, standing before a 17 or 18-year-old boy who hand-to-hand -hand combat had killed a lion had killed a bear. He was a gladiator, for God's sake. He says, I slew both the lion and the bear, and as for this uncircumcised Phil Philistine, he should be just like the lion and the bear. See, he has defied the armies of Jehovah God. David said, moreover, Jehovah, that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Saul said unto David, go. <laughs> he was the tallest man in the whole country, but he said to the little fellow, go. And the Lord be with you. In verse 45, same chapter. Then said David to the Philistine, he went straight there. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, I come to you in the name of Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, you have cursed, you have stood against. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is verse 46. It says, This day will Jehovah deliver you into my hand. I will smite you. I will take your head off of your shoulders. He might have been young, but he sure wasn't stupid. I'll give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air to the beasts of the field, earth, and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. His name is Jehovah. Verse 47, which is the next verse. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is Jehovah's. He will give you into our hands. What a man of courage. That's what we need in the world today. Men of courage. Women of courage. Rather than fighting one another, we need to know who our enemy is. David had about six brothers there. They had been called into the armed forces. Not one of them had spoken up to ready to fight a giant, of course. But they weren't fighting each other. Thank God. You've got to know who your enemy is. And you've got to go after him with all your might. It came to pass when the Philistine arose 
He must have been sitting down resting. He drew near to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army of the Philistines to meet him. David put his hand in his bag that old shepherd boys had. He took thence a stone and he slang it. And he smote the Philistine in his forehead and made a deep impression. The stone, the Bible says here, sunk, sunk into the forehead of that Philistine. He fell upon his face to the earth and David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. He took the man's own sword and, and he cut off his head. So a young kid becomes a giant killer and a lion killer. He was on the way to the throne. He was anointed when he was 17, but it was, he was 30 before he sat on the throne. Sometimes we get impatient with God and we miss what God wants to do for us through our impatience. Not only did David kill him, but he became a sweet musician at the court of King Saul. And when an evil spirit would come upon Saul, and he became so sad and so angry, you know, he would play for the king. And immediately, the king would change and be well through the sweet music and possibly the beautiful words, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And something happened to the king, he would become healed. So he got a job in the palace. I presume he already was married to the king's daughter because that was the price. He that kills the giant gets the princess. They may have delayed that because he was so young. But he came and stood before King Saul. And the Bible says the king loved him greatly. That's verse 21, 1 Samuel ch chapter 16. And he loved him greatly. And the king made David his armor bearer. <laughs> he says, I won't be afraid with that boy out in front. I'll tell you right now. And then Saul said to Jesse, David's father, let David stand before me, for he hath found great favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirits would come upon Saul that David would play on his harp with his hand. And Saul was refreshed and made well, and the spirit would depart from him. But they could not continue this way. The Lord had sought a man after his own heart because Saul was in a state of rebellion. He was in a state of uh, resisting God, of self-willed to do as he pleased. And God says we'll have to have a change to take place here. But David made friends with a son of Saul named Jonathan. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that in heaven they lived next door to each other. They truly cared for each other. In 1 Samuel 18 and 1, it says it came to pass that when he made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan, the prince, the crown prince, was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him, even as his own soul. Hard to find that kind of friend in the world that we live today, not very often do people have such a care for one another that they would die one for another. But the king took David that day and would not let him go home anymore to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David and said, I love you with all my soul. And Jonathan stripped off his robe, royal robe, crown prince robe, put it on David, 
put his other garments on David, put his sword on David, gave him his bow and his girdle around his middle. So David wins the heart of the people. One of the next great events in this young man's life was right here. The Jebusites ruled the city of Jerusalem. And David knew that Abraham had uh, made an offering there. And he, he wanted this city to be the citadel of God's presence with a great temple to be built there. And so he came himself in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 7. And he fought the Jebusites. And he made that area his capital city. And he took the stronghold of Zion. That's just over the hill there. And the same became called the city of David. And so he told one of his men, whoever goes up and takes the place of the Jebusites, kills off the people there, he should become the chief captain in my army. But David dwelt here in this fort that I am surrounded by. He called it the city of David. And here's where he lived. It was Solomon who went further. Many walls have been built around the place in the last 3,000 years, of course. We're talking about the beginnings of it. It says he chose all the, he called all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 of them, and he came with the people with him from Judah, and he brought up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called the Lord of hosts the Jehovah God that dwells between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God on a cart and they brought it up to this place that it might dwell in the midst of the people. And David played his instrument, it says, and all kind of instruments of fur and wood and harps and so forth unto the Lord to let God know that he really was ready to serve the Lord and to love the Lord with all his heart. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, And David, when they were bringing the ark into the city, which was the divine presence of God, that he danced before Jehovah with all his might, and that he was girded with a linen ephod, In 2 Samuel 6 and 15, it says, All the house of Israel brought up the ark of God, shouting with the sound of the trumpet. And then David ruled this city, called the city of David, for 40 years, before he handed it over to the chosen son, that God had spoken to him about, whose name was Solomon. What a wonderful day, what a remarkable day that was. So 3,000 years later, the names of our sons we call David. And we remember that this was the man who was a giant killer. And he was a nation builder. And that through this one, David, the great Messiah came to save the world. I'll be back in just a minute. So sorry you weren't with me, you know. I'd love to see you get as bad as I did. Jerusalem is known for its uh, 
amazing opposites, you know. When the sun shines, it shines too bright. When the wind blows, it blows too hard. When it rains, it's a torrent. I got so soaking wet till I had to go and change my clothes uh, before we could finish off this beautiful story of one of the most remarkable men that ever lived. Through this person, David, a world savior, India, China, Africa, Latin America, Europe, United States, a world savior came into being through this very dramatic giant killer. Yes, he was a great king. Yes, he was a musician. But down deep inside of him was a consciousness that one day a king would be born. His name would be called Jesus. In Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Now, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God, which was made of the seed of David. He was made of the seed of David. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, overshadowed Mary and placed the blood stream sperm within her. But she became the incubator and she became the one that housed him for, for nine months. And that part of him was the seed of David. It's amazing that it stretched for over a thousand years from that moment. And now, two thousand years later, he's still known as Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of David. All through the New Testament, when people addressed him, they said, he is the son of David. Something of a spiritual dynamic relationship was there between the Messiah and this person called David. It says he was made the seed of David according to the flesh. His fleshly parts were of the seed of David, his divine parts. He was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 4, which happens to be the next verse, and he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection uh, from the dead. Now here's a man. He became a king. He consolidated a nation. He took tribes of every kind of description. He molded them together. And they became a sovereign nation under his guidance and leadership. He was a brave man. He chose brave men to follow him. And he, he, he caused the world to change. <laughs> All over the face of this earth today, they speak with great reference and reverence regarding this man, David. So in his kingship, the people were drawn nigh to God, not away from God. They were drawn closer to God because he lived. Many of these kings that we have spoken about, at their death, they had not brought anybody to God, nor closer to God, nor with a greater revelation of God. But here's a man who taught the world <laughs> the 23rd Psalm. That's possibly said more than any other piece of prose in the history of mankind. What a man he was. And one day you shall see him face to face. And you can talk about these times all that you like. But we're glad to present to you a shepherd boy 
who was elevated into kingship. What is God going to do for your life? Where are you headed for?